Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Is There a New Normal for Grocery Shopping? A research study by Suzy and New Hope Network. Before we begin, we have a few quick housekeeping notes. The presentation can be bandwidth intensive, so we recommend you shut down any other browsers or window you may have open. All the engagement tools on your screen are customizable to allow you to watch this webinar the way you want to watch it, so feel free to move and resize them as necessary. During this webinar today, we invite you to get social. If at any time during our session you hear something interesting, we encourage you to tweet it to your followers using the Twitter widget. There will be time for questions at the end, so please submit them through the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Your hosts today are Avi Savar, President of Real-Time Market Research Platform, Suzy, and Eric Pierce, VP of Business Insights at New Hope Network. Avi, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, it is uh, honor to kind of do this again. Uh, Eric uh, and I have uh, had the pleasure of presenting some research together in the past. Um, and, you know, we're reunited here for another installment of the Eric and Avi show. So really excited to share the results of uh, this study. And uh, hey, Eric, how are you, man? Doing well, Avi. Thanks, Danielle, <laughs> for the intro. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, Gosh, Avi, it's hard to believe um, we're about to enter the second half of the year, right? Last time you and I shared with this audience uh, was early April, and we were pretty early into adjusting as a country to stay-at-home orders and just sort of all the uncertainty. Um, in some ways, it doesn't feel like a lot's changed since then, but if you choose just a slightly different reference point, it feels like everything has changed. Um, Regardless, just as we get started, as as I did in April, it feels appropriate still to me to, to wish everyone well. You know, I hope you and yours, your loved ones, your teams, your businesses yeah. and communities are doing well during these difficult times. Um, Avi and I and our businesses really want to be of service to you today, and we hope that the information we share today creates a little bit of clarity in otherwise uncertain times. Absolutely. I mean, couldn't couldn't have said it better myself. I think that's something that we're trying to do as an organization, and our partnership with New Hope has been um, really instrumental and, and terrific across the board. And I think the feedback that we've gotten from the work we're doing together has been incredibly positive. And you know, as long as uh, everybody keeps showing up to these webcasts, I think you know we'll keep doing them. Uh, so your feedback is is duly welcome, and uh, you know, really excited to jump in here. I think we've got some. Terrific insights to share. Uh, a quick, a quick moment of kind of background. Um, the data we're presenting uh, today came from Suzy, uh, which is a real-time market research platform. Uh, it's used by you know a few hundred brands uh, for high-quality, agile research. The thing that makes it unique is you know a combination of advanced research tools, but kind of bolted on with the highest quality screened and verified consumer network. So you're getting really trusted insights and you're getting it you know in record time so really proud of the work we're doing and this particular study today just to kind of lay the groundwork um we we conducted uh the study based on a thousand consumers during the week of june 11th to june 14th i think the time stamp on these uh studies is really important because the world is changing so rapidly um and just important to note kind of when we ask these questions because things tend to change in, in a you know matter of moments here um the audience of a thousand consumers are directly representative of of uh census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, uh, and region. So, and uh, I'll, I'll pause for a second too, and just say, you know, we're, we're gonna share the, the study uh, and the, the recording of this webcast after uh, it's all over, so everybody will, will be able to get a copy of it. Um, so no need to take, uh, you know, feverish notes. So let's kick things off. We have, you know, a lot of ground to cover. Uh, and you know the I, the the title of this uh, of of this webcast is the new normal for grocery shopping, and you know the new normal has become kind of part of everyday vernacular, uh, for better or for worse. Kind of like uncertain times and unprecedented times. Uh, at this point, saying things are the new normal, it almost kind of feels like we're poking fun at ourselves. Um, uh, funny anecdote, uh, the, the phrase new normal is now uh, in many ways officially associated with COVID. Uh, on Wikipedia, if you look it up, it's listed as a term in business and economics that refers to the financial conditions following the financial crisis of 2007, the global recession that followed, and now the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Um, I don't know about everybody, uh, but I'm about ready for times to be precedented again and certain. Uh, and I wouldn't mind a little bit of the old normal back, but uh, I think we're a little bit away from that. Um, that being said, you know, 48 out of 50 states have reopened in some capacity uh, after about four months of lockdown. I'm definitely sensing uh, that here and experiencing a bit of that in Connecticut where I'm, I'm holed up here for the next few months. And things are opening up. People are out and about um, wearing masks, taking the necessary precautions. But it feels like things are loosening a little bit. Uh, that being said, we're also hearing that cases are rising in many states, uh, some to their highest levels yet. And the death tolls have now topped 120,000. So sadly, we're not out of the woods. Um, you know, we have a long ways to go. And, you know, if you have heard our past webcasts, um, we've talked about this stat and, and a little bit, which is it takes an average of 66 days to form a new habit. Uh, and the big question that exists coming out of all of this is, you know, coming out of lockdown, are these new habits that we've developed and are evolving to, are they becoming the new normal? Um, as our everyday lives kind of move forward, how will that play out in the real world? Um, some will likely stick and some may not. One of the biggest adjustments that we have seen uh, and we're making is in the way we shop for groceries. Um, you can find hundreds of articles on, you know, how to shop for food properly now with all these tips and tricks and uh, videos that are getting published. But, you know, I think when you think about it, uh, it, as part of, you know, our safety measures, we're all told not to touch our face, but food literally goes in our mouths, right? So not only is it touching our face, but it, we're, we're ingesting it. And I think that creates a higher level of um, awareness. And all the things that we're buying and doing, you know, the food industry is really hitting closest to home for many people and is impacting every single human being. Um, you know, the big question, you know, will some of these new food and beverage behaviors that we're experiencing stick? And at least half of consumers that we surveyed said yes. They plan on keeping up with their new behaviors even after restrictions have been lifted. And so we're going to unpack some of those here. Um, and, you know, what we're serving up for today, uh, and, and pardon the cheesy pun, it's quite intended, uh, we're going to serve up, you know, three key areas of focus. First, kind of for the appetizer, we're going to talk about, um, you know, understanding what these habits are in the long term. And then we'll get into, you know, kind of the the consumer's new relationship with food and what that looks like. And then finally, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up talking about, you know, what as brands, what should you expect and what should you be thinking about going forward? First, uh, you know, food habits for the long term. So, uh, you know, before we get into this section, uh, we're going to do something new that we haven't done before uh, in this format. Uh, hopefully, it'll be a fun way to take your um, thoughts and engagement. Uh, we're going to run a segment we're calling Ask America. Uh, the beauty of the Suzy platform is that it's truly real time. So at the beginning of each of these sections, uh, before each course is served, we're going to suggest a few research questions that are relevant to that topic. And you, as the audience, will be able to vote for which questions you want to ask America. And at the end of the presentation, we're going to share the results. Uh, if you've been part of our, our webinars in the past, you know, we've kind of pulled the audience to bring questions to the forefront. Um, this is just a little bit more of a packaged way to do it. And, and um, hopefully you'll have some fun with it. So the first uh, poll, the first uh, uh, Ask America question, uh, please vote for which of the following you would like us to ask our consumer network. And again, we'll share the results of these at the end. Um, first question, what new food or beverage brands have you adopted during COVID-19 and plan to keep buying? Uh, what new food or beverage brands have you adopted during COVID-19 and plan to stop buying? Uh, what are the biggest challenges with online grocery shopping? And or what type of content do you want from brands that will help support you at home? Um, please vote for your favorite. Uh, I'm going to let you guys do that for a moment, and then we'll move forward. In three, two, one. Cool. So it looks like uh, what new food or beverage brands have you adopted during COVID-19 and plan to keep buying after? We're going to pose that question now, and uh, we'll share the results uh, at the end of the presentation. Cool. Great. Thanks, Avi. So first course, right? Uh, we have a three-course meal here, depending on whether or not you, you count the, 
the Ask America as a mini course in between or something. Anyways, let's go a little deeper into uh, exploring changing grocery habits. Um, we all know that COVID-19 has been a massive marketplace disruptor, rapidly turning off some parts of our economy and slowing cultural trends while accelerating growth of other parts of our economy and supercharging cultural trends in other places, right? Think about work from home culture. Feels like something that kind of trickled beneath the surface for a very long time. And because of you know the situation that we're all in with, with COVID-19, many of us are in, very fortunate I guess those of us who are able to work from home, um, you know, are suddenly in a place where companies are thinking very differently about how they think about corporate real estate and work offices. And that's going to force changes in thinking about company culture, right? Healthcare, fitness, all of these things are really being accelerated or in some ways slowed down dramatically by the changes happening here. The same is true for online shopping, and that's one of the first things we wanted to talk about today. Uh, in early May, CNBC reported on a Bain & Company um, estimate that U.S. online grocery spending increased from 3 to 4% of all U.S. grocery dollar sales to somewhere between 10 and 15%, and that was, uh, again, in early May. At the same time period, New Hope, uh, we did a study that roughly estimated about a 30% increase in the number of consumers that regularly buy groceries online. So what we're not seeing necessarily is, is a, you know, we're seeing a big change in grocery shopping online. It's not necessarily everybody. It's not ubiquitous yet, but we're seeing uh, massive changes uh, in that behavior. So the question to ask is, will consumers keep these new behaviors or revert back to old habits and behaviors as the economy begins to open up? In early April, we asked consumers if they felt going to grocery stores was uh, safe. Uh, only 32% yes. Today, that number is up. So while 50% of consumers today say they feel safe going to the grocery store, um, 59% say that they plan to continue grocery shopping online. So this is 59% of those who are currently shopping online say they could plan to continue doing so. Uh, in addition to that, 28% of those who uh, are shopping online think that they'll actually do more so sort of in a post-quarantine, post-lockdown sort of time period. So much of this shift may prove to be a longer term one in nature as we're searching for what the new normal is. Online is going to be a bigger part of that, of course. Um, while the share of online grocery spend is still on the somewhat lower side, it has definitely accelerated, opening the doors to online not only as an option, but increasingly as the norm for many. The other maybe unexpected recipient of increased consumer visits um, may be locally owned grocery stores. We found that 28% of consumers told us that as a result of the pandemic, they're more likely to shop local versus national chain stores. It may be that these stores did a better job of meeting consumers' functional or emotional needs during this time. Maybe the community-focused nature of these stores or the more engaged and supportive staff may have connected emotionally with consumers in a time when they really need that either that assurance of safety in the stores or just a little extra comfort while shopping yeah and and beyond you know the retail experience itself the food that consumers are trying uh, is also different whether you know it was a matter of what i wanted wasn't in stock or i feel like some trying something new the whopping majority of people have been trying new items new things 70 percent of consumers said they have tried a new brand or product in the past two weeks right uh, at first, I think that you know, the behavior was more about survival uh, and consumers were stockpiling. And that behavior has kind of subsided and consumers now want new products. Uh, they're exploring and, a ver and, and, and the variety is, is becoming more and more important in this new normal. Um, maybe that's about boredom, boredom, which has been kind of a huge theme during the pandemic. And of course, you know, cooking, uh, trying to make new things at home uh, has been kind of an antidote to that boredom, right? Cooking is 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 massively on trend. Um, and we're not going out to new restaurants to try new things. So we have to take matters into our own hands. Uh, and so there's this shift in behavior is, is pretty massive. Um, this also has implications for innovation as a food and beverage brand. So the big question is, you know, are brands in a position or, you know, retailers in a position to begin kind of thinking, investing and innovating in, in more new products? Because um, consumers certainly seem ready for it. Cool. Uh, and, you know, uh, this is also opening up the door for kind of new long term relationships between brands and shoppers during the lockdown. Uh, the entire paradigm changed. Right. Consumer spending shifted in full force from food service like eating out right to, to grocery retail, dining in right at home. 
And with that, a lot of products went out of stock. We had to ask, you know, we'd ask consumers uh, what they did when this happened and, and, you know, when they couldn't get the brands they normally buy. And most were likely to buy a brand that they didn't try before in order to get those needs met. And now 49% of consumers are saying they plan to continue shopping for brands they would not normally have purchased. So this new normal in many ways is allowing for new brands to be discovered, right? And for some, that's a threat. And for many, that's an opportunity. Um, talked about cooking, right? C- cooking is uh, uh, here to stay in a, in a big way. Um, and, you know, as we kind of continue down this hypothetical food funnel uh, from how consumers shop to where they shop and now what they're doing with their purchases, it all seems to come back to cooking. Um, more than half of consumers started cooking more at home. And, and since then, you know, we said kind of 66 days to make a new habit. Uh, the reality is, you know, this is something that will likely stick for a long time, right? A whopping 72% of consumers said they plan to continue cooking at the same levels that they are doing during the quarantine one things release. Um, That's bad news in many ways for food service. That being said, like travel and hospitality, the food service industry is likely going to take, you know, potentially years to recover from this. Um, But this is also great news for brands and retailers who, you know, want to consider, you know, forecasting in the future for the demand of their products. And also, you know, again, thinking about new products and and, and innovation. Uh, 49% of consumers are cooking meals from scratch, right? So this is kind of the underlying opportunity in some of these new norms, right? Uh, it, It allows for brands and retailers to kind of enter the narrative, right, in some ways, to provide value offer expertise, Uh, simply offering up recipes and other forms of content is a natural way to do this. Um, You don't even need to be a brand that produces food products to take advantage of this trend. You know, a a fun example is the uh, Hilton's Doubletree brand, right? Uh, This is a brand that's known if you've ever, you know, traveled for business or whatnot, they're known for, you know, when you check in, they have these awesome chocolate chip cookies. Well, that recipe has been under lock and key uh, with the Hilton brand for, you know, for, for many years. And for the first time, they revealed the recipe, right? Um, and even as their bookings are down dramatically, they're trying to keep themselves relevant and top of mind with consumers uh, and interacting with them in, in kind of a completely unrelated but relevant way that's very much on trend. Yeah. So what does all this mean? Uh, kind of closing in on the end of, of, of our first course here. What does this mean as we search for clues for what food habits are here to stay? I would actually caution and say, I think it's hard to say at this point, um, we're hunting for the new normal, but it's still, there's a lot of change, a lot of change happening in consumers' lives. Um, and it's hard to know exactly what the new normal is going to look like. But we've got, you know, a couple of months, you know, under our belt and we're seeing some patterns emerge and habits being created. It does look like the future. Uh, normal is going to look like more online shopping. Uh, hopefully, and in the data suggests, maybe some more local shopping, more cooking at home, and more food experimentation, both in uh, maybe we're getting back to food experimentation, you know, at the grocery store, but more food experimentation uh, in terms of what people are cooking and how they're finding uh, new experiences at home. Yeah. And so, you know, what does that mean for you as a brand, right? For, for you folks that are, that are listening in here, um, it, it means you need to be accessible, right? You need to be visible to your consumers with clear messaging and availability. Um, you need to be innovative. You need to keep innovating. Consumers are trying all new kinds of things and they're looking for variety. And you need to add value. You need to integrate into these new routines, integrate yourself into these new behaviors. And the best way to do that uh, is to help out and add value. Um, and Avi, I just add to that. Yeah, if I can, I'll just add to that for for sure. retailers. Uh, I think hopefully you're starting to see the signs of it in your stores, but we're seeing signs of it in the data that consumers are interested in shopping new products. And um, obviously, it's been a hard couple of months, and uh, you know the challenges you guys have had to. Um, take on in terms of uh, shifting so much of our spend from food service to in retail has been challenging. But there's a lot of interesting brands and a lot of opportunities out there. And I'm excited for for all of the brands in the space and retailers to to begin driving more growth again through new product mm-hmm. innovation. And consumers seem to be ready for that. Absolutely. Absolutely.
Um, so the the main course here is uh, uh, is the new relationship with food, consumers' new relationship with food, and um, you know the reality is that our relationship with food has significantly shifted since the onset of COVID. Right, um, so many variables have changed from how much we exercise to the money we have for spending to the amount of time that we're now at home, um, and you know we want to uncover what that all means and how it impacts kind of the new relationship with food. And uh, but before we get into it, we're going to do our next Ask America uh, segment. So we're going to throw up some questions that you can vote on. Here you go. Uh, the first is, uh, how has their relationship with food changed uh, during COVID-19? Second option is, what food brands have they seen publicly take a stand on social causes? Uh, what healthy foods are the consumers willing to splurge on? Uh, how important is the role of brand in food and beverage products that they're buying now? Uh, take a few seconds to vote. Uh, we'll throw those questions into Susie. And as I mentioned, we'll share those results at the end of the presentation. So I'll let you guys take a couple seconds here. In three, two, one. All right. So it looks like uh, what healthy foods are you willing to splurge on is the uh, winning question. Uh, we'll throw that into Susie and, and circle back with everybody. Cool. So um, at the highest level, you know, let's not forget that this pandemic has has created unprecedented unemployment, right? Highest unemployment rates pretty much ever. Um, as of May, over 20 million people were unemployed. Uh, and this no, no doubt has an effect uh, and a direct impact on the types of products that uh, we're bringing into our homes and the types of places we order from and how much we're willing to spend. Um, and it's it's really having a massive ripple effect and probably will continue to do so for a very long time. Um, it also has forced us all to look broadly at ourselves and and be a little bit more introspective. And, you know, 75 percent 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 of consumers said that this pandemic has made them kind of reevaluate their priorities in life. Right. That's kind of a big question. But Beyond, you know, people that have been directly impacted by nor uh, unemployment, this new normal is forcing us all to kind of look at everything, right? From where we live to how we spend our time and who we spend our time with. Um, in many ways, it's kind of forcing us to ask a lot of why and, you know, why have we been doing the things that we've been doing for so long the way that we've been doing them? And of course, food is a huge part of that, right? Um, you know, as we have these ex existential conversations with ourselves and our loved ones. Uh, in the background, there's always been this kind of list of our basic and fundamental needs, right? At the top of that list is food, along with shelter, uh, sanitation, education, healthcare, right? These are all basic needs that are no longer in the background. They are squarely in the foreground and uh, very much top of mind with everybody. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's, it's changing the way we do a lot of things and the way we're thinking about a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, Avi. Thanks. Thanks for that. It's, it's, um, you know, it's an interesting mix. And some of the survey work that we did um, and presented in April, we saw consumers really looking to a variety of different ways of meeting their needs. I think both as they struggled to figure out sort of how they were going to, you know, take all of their food in home and cook it themselves or prepare yeah. all their meals and all of these things. Um, but also increasingly as time's gone on, yeah, the, the financial impact um, that this has had on people is is not to be underestimated and the strain that it's had on on families and 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 everyone's budgets. Um, and so one of the things we are seeing is that given this, you know, it's no surprise that right now as we're thinking about people and they're reevaluating their relationship with food and what they want from brands, that one of the things people are looking for is more affordable products. 43% of consumers told us that in comparison to typical behaviors in 2019, over the past two weeks, again, our survey was completed just a, a week or so ago here. Um, people are, you know, 43% say they're, they're looking for more affordable products more than they did in, in 2019. And 48% are buying more products on sale than they did in 2019. So, so clearly budget's an issue for, for many. Um, but, as we showed you in April, consumers value more than just low prices. They always have. But I think that this reevaluation of priorities is also playing into how people think about food. Many consumers seem to be reprioritizing health and healthier eating um, during the pandemic. This was a shift that we saw, of course, uh, long before COVID. But this might be one of those trends that receives sort of an extra boost from the changes in habits and lifestyles and reevaluations. This seems to be something that may be growing in, in importance for consumers 
numbers. So often when we write surveys, we recommend, um, you know, maybe not putting price into an attribute list where we're going to ask people what's most important, right? Um, price is basically a given, you know, right? But you always have to be pretty affordable. You always have to be best on price or something like that. Consumers almost always tell us that's the number one most important thing in our surveys. Um, you know, we'll caveat things, a price aside or savings aside, what's most important to you? We didn't do that when we asked this question. Um, what we ask consumers is what's most important to them when and buying groceries and what do they expect to be most important in the next three months and what we see here is healthy food rising to the top right um, statistically it's probably not meaningfully different than than the price item here um, but the reality is we think that this idea that that health is right up there alongside price is a clear indication of some of these priority shifts that are going on in consumers' lives. So while consumers face financial strain and uncertainty of COVID, um, they're also looking they're looking for ways to cut costs, but they're still investing in their health. Seventy five percent of consumers tell us that personal health issues are more important to them today than they were in 2019. As an example, this is a quote from two vegan restaurant owners who in their 13 years of business have noticed that people are reevaluating costs based on what's in their food. They they say, these there's restaurant owners tell us that people are looking at the cost of our food in a totally different way. And they're realizing that what we eat does matter, right? So it's not just, wow, $15 for a salad. It's what am I getting out of that? What are the health benefits? You know, what is what is the broader experience um, that I'm going to have with this food? And increasingly, consumers are seeing the value of investing in their health um, and they're seeing it worth it. Not always, not every occasion, not every time, um, but on more occasions with more consumers. For sure. And, you know, ultimately, I think because of this shifting relationship with food and a, and a major focus on health, right, consumers are now using food as a vehicle for, for better health, right? 77% um, of the consumers we talk to who are more concerned about health issues say that they're likely to buy food and beverages or supplements to address those concerns. 77% is a pretty massive number. Um, and, you know, we can't really go to the gym outside of our homes and, and access fitness in the same way uh, that we had in the past. So that's been impacted. And so now we have to be much more mindful about, you know, what we put into our bodies. And that could be a big part of what's happening here. Right. Um, and of course, consumers are, you know, paying paying much more attention to food than ever. Right. If I can't go to the gym anymore to work off that cheeseburger, then, you know, maybe I need to rethink having that cheeseburger in the first place. And so consumers are much more critical now about their food choices. And almost 70 percent said they're more conscious of the food they consume because of covid. Right. And and 26 percent said that they're much more conscious with 43 percent saying they were more conscious. So the numbers are, are, are pretty staggering and that this is kind of top of mind for everyone. And of course, you know, healthier foods have become more of a priority now than than pre COVID. So 65 percent of consumers saying they're likely to buy healthier food as a result of the pandemic. Right. Um, again, a pretty big, big number here. And with that higher demand um, comes also higher demand for organic. Right. Thirty four percent of consumers said they're buying more organic products than before. Uh, the other thing that I found incredibly interesting is it's not just about what they're consuming. Um, it's it, they're also paying attention, you know, not just to what goes into their bodies, but also how their food choices are impacting the world around them. Um, we're seeing, you know, kind of this paradigm shift happening across the board with food and food consciousness from being, you know, food that's good for me to, you know, being good for my body to being good for the environment. And, you know, 24% of the consumers that we, uh, we surveyed said that, you know, they're buying food in eco-friendly packaging. Um, it's almost all of these unexpected changes that kind of are making evaluate in some respects, how fragile, you know, the world really is around us. Yeah, I think it's it's a fragile world, but it's also just an increasingly complex one. And one of the interesting things that we've all been talking about, I think anyone in the food and beverage industries thought about this a lot. We talk about it in the natural product space quite a bit, is this idea of consumers voting with their wallets, right? I increasingly, yeah. I think that consumers feel a desire to take action on social issues, to take action on environmental issues, you know, um, and, and they struggle always to know exactly what they can do. Um, sometimes they look to government or big business and maybe they aren't sure if, if those are going to, those organizations are going to provide solutions all the time. And so they find their way very often to companies that differentiate themselves based on social and environmental actions that they're taking that the consumer can almost feel like by supporting this company, I'm voting for 
the change that I want to see in the world. And, and so we're seeing consumers respond in that way. This idea of you know buying based on sustainable packaging is powerful uh, and exciting and something that's helped propel a lot of innovation in the space over the years. We've talked about, again, consumers voting with their wallets when they're maybe unsure how to act on their own. They're looking to brands and businesses to help. Um, we see that here as well. Consumers want brands to help. In a world full of uncertainty, consumers want brands to bring meaning beyond just the products that they're buying. 62% of consumers tell us that they're more likely to purchase uh, from food brands that publicly stand for issues or causes that they believe in. Not only do consumers want brands to take a stand, uh, they want to know that brands care about the environment and social equity and justice issues. 66% tell us that environmental issues are more important to them today than they were in 2019, and 74% feel that social equity and justice issues are more important to them they were, than they were in 2017. As a result, um, I think that brands, consumers are expecting much more from brands. Uh, consumers want health and nutrition and lower prices and the fun of discovering and experimenting with new things and finding new products and flavors and taste experiences. Um, but they also want brands support and they want brands to take a stand on health, sustainability and social issues as well. Um, and let's not forget, though, you know, while we talk about sort of the deep, complex issues of, of social justice and, and environmental issues, um, let's not forget that, again, for consumers, food also has to be fun. Um, we may be more intentional about bringing it into our lives and more intentional about what we're putting in our bodies. Maybe we see food as medicine or, you know, to, to hope that food will help provide solutions to health issues. Um, but it is still also entertainment, right? Websites like BuzzFeed and Tasty have seen major increases in recipe-based content during COVID. And what we're seeing here is that 50% of consumers are watching more cooking content than they did last year. So they're cooking more at home um, and they're wanting to explore through through recipes as well. A great example of a brand that's um, involved in entertainment but not necessarily in food is Disney Parks. Um, a lot of kids this year didn't get their dream vacation, uh, but Disney Parks uh, gave consumers a way to be able to still literally taste the experience. In, in early April, Disney responded to park closures by giving away the recipe to their churro, bright, the churro bites. Brands are playing right into this, uh, tying entertainment and food together, recognizing that there's a sp more space in people's lives for these things to come together in that way. And they're mm -hmm. also in the process then enabling consumers um, as well as their desire to to cook more at home. So. What does this mean as we wrap up this section? What does this mean for our search for the new normal, uh, consumers' new relationships with food? The new normal may be uh, a bigger focus on health, right? More functional foods. Avi had that number of 77%, you know, who were concerned about some health issue were hoping to be able to buy functional foods and beverages to help them with that. Um, you know, I, this idea of consumers increasingly seeing food as medicine, not literally as medicine, but as something that they should be doing and treating uh, their own health more proactively. And then as well, we see growing interest in social and environmental issues uh, for consumers as well. Yeah. And and really, I think, you know, you zoom out, like it, it, for, for you as a brand, you know, what does it mean? It means that you need to be demonstrating clear benefits beyond taste. You know, we talked about functional benefits. We talked about price. We talked about entertainment. There are a lot of areas that um, that as a brand now you need to kind of zoom out and be talking about in order to, in many ways, kind of be empathetic to, to the world that exists and the, 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 the consumer's behavior uh, shift that we're experiencing. And, you know, consumers are going to be looking for brands that you know, show their positions and their actions on, you know, environmental, social and health issues across the board. So, you know, it means a lot more to people to associate and tie back to the things they care about, um, both internally from their health uh, and well-being, as well as externally from where they think existentially they should build long as, as, as the world evolves. So kind of coming into, uh, um, the, you know, our, our, our last course, the dessert here, uh, you know, our, our, our final section, what brands should expect. Um, we're going to kick this section off again with an Ask America uh, poll. So let's, uh, let's do that, and then we'll jump right in. So tell us what you want us to ask uh, in this section. Option one, given COVID-19, how do you plan to shift uh, your summer plans? Are you concerned about hosting friends and family for events over the summer? What do you expect from brands during the holidays? 
And finally, how much more or less will you be spending on food uh, over the holidays? So cast your vote and we'll reveal those answers uh, in just a few minutes when we wrap things up. Cool. All right, and I'm gonna move on in a couple seconds. Awesome. All right, it looks like, what do you expect from brands during the holidays uh, as the, uh, the winning question? So we'll throw that into Susie and circle back with everybody. Yeah, very timely. A lot of decisions need to be made pretty soon with regards to holiday yeah. products and what's on the shelves. I get it. Um, so let's talk about the elephant in the room on this last piece here. Um, the biggest considerations for brands, you know, right now, given all the disruption that's happening in consumers' lives, might be how to maintain loyalty. During COVID, consumers are trying new products and brands. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the majority plan on sticking with these brands that they tried. There were a lot of out of stocks. There were a lot of things that just weren't available at the time and consumers had needs and didn't have the luxury of shopping around for things. And so they tried new brands and a lot of, of brands are sticking with them. This is both uh, exciting and scary, right? Good news for retailers and brands that want to shift some of their energy back to innovation that consumers are shopping in this space. And, uh, and that's great, again, and powerful and important for driving engagement and growth uh, with consumers through new products. The, the bad news is for products that may have been out of stock or hard to find at some point in the past three months, uh, there's challenges there. So... Uh, consumers, once again, are open to product discovery and exploration. 49% of new product trial recently was driven by curiosity. Um, you know, earlier on in, in early April, we saw that not all of it, but a, a meaningful chunk of, you know, new brand trial was coming out of a, a need, right, or out of stocks. They just needed something and this was what was available. Uh, consumer openness to try new things and the fact that they are sticking with it now, to me, is a clue that uh, to us, uh, sorry, there's a clue to us that consumers have been satisfied with a lot of the products that they brought into their homes during these stay at home periods and either, you know, maintaining that loyalty and, and keeping those customers is going to be critical in the time ahead. Or if you happen to have maybe lost a little bit of share during this time period, figuring out how you win your way back into consumer shopping baskets and, and cupboards. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, with, with States now, you know, reopening and summer months are kind of upon us. Um, the consumers that we talked to, 35% of them said that they're planning to host, you know, friends and family this summer. So there's naturally going to be more social interactions coming, right? Certainly not at the scale that, you know, that, that happened pre COVID. Um, but the reality is, you know, those same consumers, 48 or 48% of them said they plan to visit family and 30% of them are taking road trips, right? So, and arguably food's going to be at the center of a lot of those interactions. Uh, that being said, we're still a long way away from the old normal, right? 63% of people are not ready to travel by air. 54% of people are not ready to go back to bars and restaurants to socialize. So, you know, for the foreseeable future, we are going to be living this new normal. Um, and as a brand, and, and we're, we're going to have to figure out how to evolve and operate under, you know, kind of this new paradigm. So, you know, you know, holidays are coming, uh, you know, and, 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 and we need to figure out kind of how to navigate through the holidays. Um, and, you know, a lot of things have been canceled and postponed over the last few months. Um, the holidays are not getting canceled, right? So how should we be thinking about the holidays? Uh, it might be a little too early to be, you know, thinking about behaviors through, you know, Thanksgiving and maybe the winter holidays, but hopefully, you know, July 4th can be a, a little bit of a, a, a you know, a, a crystal ball in terms of how we can start to think about it. So maybe some lessons learned from what we're seeing coming up in the next couple of weeks. 44% uh, of consumers are still planning some type of 4th of July celebration. Right. The majority of which about 26 percent said they're going to be ce celebrating with, you know, a small party or barbecue with friends and family. So, you know, generally speaking, the show will go on. Right. And, and there will be some form of celebration taking place. Um, but the major difference, you know, is that we're going to be, you know, spending less time in public places and more time, you know, cooking our own food. You know, surprise, surprise. Uh, that means less ordering uh, and less catering than the past. And, you know, 67 percent of the consumers celebrating the fourth said they're going to be cooking their own food, you know, at home. So, you know, clearly um, cooking seems to be a very common theme that's 
that's very persistent throughout all this. And, you know, I would, I would be, you know, if I'm a betting man and I often am, um, that's going to be a behavior that's going to stick going in well beyond, um, you know, once the world starts to open again. Great. So as we bring dessert to a close, um, you know, what does this mean for the the clues that we have here as to what the new normal might look like? Um, unfortunately, I think, you know, first point, maybe this is fortunate, maybe it's unfortunate. I guess it's a perspective thing, right? <laughs> um, from a business perspective, unfortunate that um, the return to sort of normal or the previous things that we used to do might looks to me like it's going to be a little bit slower than maybe we had expected, certainly slower than we thought it would be in April, um, for sure. So a uh, slow return to the old way of doing things, if at all. Uh, s smaller gatherings, it, it does look like people want to get out, but they kind of want to be outside and they want to be with smaller groups um, and less travel, uh, especially air travel at this point. So if, if your business is, is tied to some of that, um, that, that's probably coming back slower than, than expected at this point. Back to you, Avi, to bring us in. Yeah, and and so you know, what does that really mean uh, for for you as a brand? Uh, it simply put, um, brands need to keep adding value. This is a consistent theme that that we've seen not just in this report, but you know, since we've been um, uh, researching and tracking COVID, you know, since basically the end of February, early March. Um, it has always been a consistent theme to 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 help consumers navigate through this and add value. Um, and in this case, you know, as we enter the holidays, consumers are going to be looking for brands that can help them entertain, that can help them, you know, um, through these times. And, you know, they're going to be looking for brands that they can share with people closest to them because that's the reality of how they're going to be spending those holidays, right? Smaller, intimate, more intimate gatherings, either with people that I've quarantined with up until this point or my immediate uh, circle of, of, of friends and family that, that I want to share with. So, you know, smaller, more intimate is definitely going to be a theme. Um, and if you have the ability to kind of be a brand that is shared in that experience, you know, you're going to be winning. So, uh, you know, uh, before we, uh, you know, this is kind of the end of the menu here. And before we reveal the Ask America questions in just a couple seconds, um, I want to take a moment and, and, and thank Eric and, and the, the entire team at New Hope. We're like super grateful for the, the partnership. And, and on behalf of Eric and myself, Hope you found this content, you know, valuable, uh, and hopefully we've been of service to you. Uh, and so, like I said in the beginning, as long as you guys keep showing up for these, we'll continue to to produce them. Um, I also encourage everybody to visit um, our Insights Hub at suzy.com slash COVID-19. Uh, we're posting content there on a regular basis. All the research that we conduct um, is is presented there, uh, and daily statistics get get updated. Um, also, uh, you know, if you're interested in learning more about Suzy and how Suzy can help your business, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email address is here. It's avis at suzy.com, and I'll certainly help facilitate. Um, I mentioned also everybody's going to be getting a copy of this deck along with the recording uh, of the webcast so you can reference it for, you know, um, information in the future. So let's get to the Ask America uh, results here. Um, my colleague, Abel Flint, is going to share the, his screen uh, from the Suzy platform directly, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, pull up those, those results. Javi, I'm sharing screen right now, so I don't know if you can see it. Okay. Uh, I don't see it. Um... Yeah, no, I don't see it. Uh, maybe if you want to talk through the, the results, since you have the screen open, uh, we can do it that way. Yeah, definitely. So uh, the first cool. question I would ask are, what healthy foods are you willing to splurge on? Um, I think overwhelming the results that we got were uh, people are willing to spend money on fruits, vegetables. We got meats, legumes, yogurt, uh, fresh and organic vegetables, uh, avocados, broccoli, apples. So basically a lot of things that fall in line kind of with uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, the next question that we asked was, what do you expect from food and beverage brands during the holidays? Um, I think overwhelmingly. Uh, people are looking for promotions, they're looking for discounts, uh, they're looking for specials on prices, they're looking for offers, uh, sales, um, but I think they're also looking for some balance between seasonal products, 
uh, for ways that help them celebrate. They're looking for healthy foods uh, and they're looking for kind of maybe new varieties um, just for the holiday season. Um, and then the final question that we got is, what new food and beverage brands have you adopted during COVID-19 uh, and plan to keep buying afterwards? Um, so we got people who said that, you know, overwhelmingly they were buying healthy foods. I think a lot of people bought frozen. Um, we see people who are buying new uh, teas, um, new types of proteins, um, chips, and snacks. Um, so that's kind of the, the latest results from all these. And we'll share uh, these also in the final deck that we share out with everyone. Terrific. Thanks, Abel, for, for jumping in there. Appreciate it. Um, and hopefully now we have some time uh, for questions from the audience. We do. Thank you so much, Eric and Avi, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, before we get to the audience questions, let me just remind everyone that there is still time to submit questions through the Q&A tool on your screen. Um, if we run out of time to respond today, we'll be sending your questions to Eric and Avi, and they will respond. Um, as we do have some already, I will dive right in. Um, first question up is, what role will private label play in the new normal? That's great. Eric, you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, interesting question on that one. I think that um, you know, for for many consumers, again, exploration is something that we're seeing that's that's hot for consumers again. So for those uh, private label brands that are you know uh, really effective in the fast following space, offering a um, a good experience for consumers at a more affordable price, I, I think that that's going to strike a good balance for a lot of consumers. Um, you know, not everything's going to fit perfectly into that space. I think. Um, that again, the the price and quality positioning that many private label brands bring will will again fit for consumers. So I, I think that again, looking for that intersection of novel, new, interesting experiences that consumers might be craving in the store right now, um, and affordable prices from a trusted brand is is going to be the sweet spot for those brands right now. Um, yeah. Awesome. Great, thank you. How do you? Envision food sampling tasting post COVID 19. Best practices for trade shows in the new world. Wow, that's yeah, a great uh, question. It is a, it is a good one. Go ahead, um, challenging for sure. Um, our, we've got a team, so anyone who's really seriously interested in going deeper on this, we've, we've got a team at New Hope um, because we host Expo East and Expo West that has put a lot of thinking into what events will look like for us um, in the near future. You know, right now, if I'm thinking about how do I translate a little bit of what we've learned and thinking about our own shows uh, into what might be most relevant for people right now in uh, sampling at grocery stores, might might well be thinking about single servings. You know, I think... Um, individually wrapped things, slightly more expensive, um, harder to do. You can't do it in every category, of course. Um, but I, I do think that for in-person sampling, that there's a real opportunity for brands to be much more targeted and selective as to when and where and how they do that, and potentially considering then the extra cost of of individually wrapped, um, just to, in the short term, provide consumers with that extra feeling of security and comfort in getting back into sampling. Um, that said, I also think there's really interesting companies out there that are doing uh, fascinating things with uh, remote sampling. So if you're a brand, uh, this isn't so great for retail necessarily, but if you're a brand who's a digital native brand or uh, you know really trying to get discovered by consumers, there are interesting uh, innovative solutions. Companies like Sampler, who's a partner of ours, and others that are figuring out how to get samples directly into consumers' homes in very targeted um, and meaningful ways. So uh, that's kind of what I'm seeing as the, the first steps for brands right now. Yeah, we're also seeing, you know, a, 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 a heightened interest in, in um, you know, at-home subscription boxes and things of that nature. I know that, you know, doesn't always work for every type of product, um, but, you know, folks are, are getting stuff delivered at home and bundles of products are, are arriving uh, and I think that's also been an interesting way uh, for consumers to discover new products um, through some of these kind of at-home subscription boxes and, and home delivery services uh, that, that seem to have spiked over the last few months. Great. Thank you. Um, you mentioned consumers are willing to try new things, but if the new normal is to go in and out of the store, how will they have time to try an innovative product? 
Yeah, I mean, we, we've got a question on that. I don't know if you, I don't have the numbers directly in front of me, but I'll, I'll respond on that. And maybe you've got perspective yeah. as well. Um, we uh -huh. did uh, both in April or maybe it was, or, or, you know, late April or early April, I can't remember. And then again, fairly recently, we asked a question about whether or not people were kind of really in and out of the grocery stores or, you know, beginning to spend more time. And what we are seeing is that, Consumers aren't quite as laser focused as they were in early April, where the, the advice was you've got a list, you get in, get your things, get back out right now. There are a lot of consumers who are still very focused like that. But I do think that part of what we're beginning to see is uh, consumers are increasing the number of trips they're willing to take um, out to grocery and they're willing to spend a little bit more time. I still still think consumers are fairly focused. Um, but we're seeing a softening of that. And, and so there is more time for discovery in store, both by increased visits as well as longer time in the store. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that as well. I think, you know, some of it also goes back to, you know, some of the stuff we talked about earlier, which is adding value, creating content. I mean, a tremendous amount of discovery right now is happening through social media feeds, through, you know, food influencers, um, the number of TikTok videos that are demonstrating different types of food products, things of that nature are skyrocketing. I think people are searching um, more than they have been in the past. So in a lot of ways, it's kind of on you to also figure out not just how you know to be relevant in the store, but also how to be relevant in the feed. Right. And, and what I mean by feed, obviously, I mean, social feed, like how are people talking about you? Um, what influencers are 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 uh, engaging with your brand, you know, and those are some areas that I think you know people are beginning to discover new things through um, content consumption and social sharing. How are consumers looking to brands to respond to the other big event of our time, racial injustice? Yeah, that's a that's a a, a a powerful question, and I think in in many ways, um, a lot of brands are still trying to figure it out um, and doing their best the best they can to to navigate. I think a lot of it is just about solidarity and showing uh, kind of their ability to understand and empathetically be part of the conversation in some way. Um, and I don't think that this is going to be an issue that's going away anytime soon. And, and as part of, you know, everything from diversity uh, efforts in leadership and staffing all the way through to how uh, their products are being marketed, the language they're using. I think every brand that we're talking to and that we work with, um, ourselves included, and all of our partners are really um, looking at every part of their business uh, and every part of their messaging, um, you know, to 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 really think about you know this new world order and and how to really add value and and be part of the the solution. Um, Eric, I, I don't know if you you've got any yeah. insight there. Yeah, a little bit to layer on. Um, first, uh, thank you for asking. It is such an important topic right now. There's yeah. um, so much to learn and unlearn for so many of us right now. For anyone interested in doing some of that learning and unlearning, of course, there's there's piles of incredible resources out there. One that is specific to our industry, a partner, again, of New Hopes, is the JEDI Collaborative. So Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, JEDI Collaborative. Um, they're a great organization. Uh, take a look at them. They're compiling resources. They're there to help with a lot of this. Um, and the advice they're giving right now, of course, is to be a little careful with virtual, si virtual, uh, sorry, virtue signaling. And I think there's a, a fine balance between, you know, communicating support and just starting out and doing, you know, authentically your own work. And so the advice that I think is being given right now by the Jedi Collaborative and some others is start by cleaning your own house. You know, that means learning and unlearning, but that also means looking within your organization and starting there. Um, maybe that means you're, you're messaging or maybe it doesn't, but you know, the, the meaningful work that most of our businesses right now can do are not necessarily marketing. Um, it's internal. What are we doing within our organizations, um, within our own individuals to improve how we support, uh, change and, and equity in, in, in the world? Absolutely. What's the biggest breakdown in the food supply chain? Mm -hmm. Eric, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, um, it's a tough, tough question. I don't know that I'm the right person to answer it. Um, there were a lot of concerns, um, and I don't know that I saw necessarily the biggest breakdown. You know, some of the concerns that we're seeing out there in the market is 
you know, uh, and, you know, a good news is that people are really interested in supporting their immune health. And so there's kind of been a run on immune health, uh, functional food ingredients. Um, anytime that happens, there's risks of adulteration, um, and cheating within the supply chain. And so there is some risk there. I'm not saying I'd call it a breakdown, but if you're, you're jumping on the bandwagon or if you've got interesting products in that space, paying attention to quality is of increased importance. Um, I think that there were some concerns. Um, you know, in terms of our ability to maintain the capacity needed within a lot of our co-manufacturer plants and to, to kind of get everything running and moving. There were clearly bottlenecks within distribution channels um, as we shifted so much spend from at home to in grocery retail. Um, packaging, you know, was a, a bottleneck for, for some brands as well. I don't know that I would necessarily say there was a single biggest breakdown, or at least, again, I'm I'm not educated enough on exactly that to, to know that. But those were a lot of the concerns that we were hearing and watching as, as we, you know, supported our, our retailers as well as brands in the industry over the last three months. Yeah, I would imagine, too, that, you know, just general um, safe, safety measures and safety precautions, you know, within the, the workforce um, has also had a pretty dramatic impact. It seems like many of, of, of you know, these brands have, have figured out um, and evolved, you know, their their standard operating procedures. But I think, you know, that's going to continue to be a, an issue as people now are coming back to work. Um, you know, we're certainly as a business, you know, n not in the food industry necessarily, but, you know, everybody's thinking right now about as offices open up and as people start to go back to work, what and how do we begin to interact with each other? Um, and part of the supply chain is, of course, people and, and people's jobs within it. Will in-store supplement sales return to normal levels anytime soon, or is this online shift permanent? Uh, interesting. Um, so our NBJ team has done some research on that. I don't have the, the latest data. So, uh, I know that there was a webinar that they did probably just yesterday, or maybe it was, uh, yes, yesterday. Um, take, take a look at that. Follow up with me. Um, I'm not sure where this question came from, but you know, I'm, I'm EP or set new hope.com. Shoot me a note and I can connect you with the NBJ team. Um, clearly supplements do really well, um, in online sales because of their, their weight profile profile and their and their pricing and so it's easy to sell online we've definitely seen an increase across the board in supplement well not across the board but in in many ways for a lot of supplement categories um, I believe that we've seen that both in retail and online uh, so the nuance of that particular question is is one that I'd have to turn over to the NBJ team to, to engage in a more meaningful way for you oh and for those who don't know NBJ nutrition business journal <laughs> <laughs> Yes, very important to remind them. What is the one product category an online grocer retailer must sell in the months ahead? Hmm. Ask the question again. The one category must sell. I didn't. I'm not sure. I what is that. the What is the one product category an online grocer re, grocery retailer must sell in the months ahead? Interesting question, um, Avi. Any any thoughts on your yeah, side? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm I'm trying to think of kind of like the how to unpack the question. I guess you know, cat, 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 they must sell everything, right? I mean, in order to survive, we need to to drive commerce, and I think you know. I'll be, I'd be looking at, you know, what's happening in the summer months. I'd be looking at, you know, some of these new behaviors that we talked about and, and, and pushing the categories that make the most sense. Um, I don't know if that's a, you know, a real answer to the question, but I think I'm having a little bit of a hard time kind of understanding the, 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 the question itself. Yeah. And, and, uh, I would love to to look at um, sales patterns. Unfortunately, it's really hard to get good Amazon sales data. Um, I would look at what's selling in store, you know, um, um, through spins, you know, if if possible, and and get a sense for what's high, you know. Um, I just don't have access to to that data enough to to feel like I can posit it again. Uh, I mentioned supplements a minute ago. They, if you're not selling supplements, that's a product category that does really well um, online. Again, because of its its profile, its its price to weight ratio, things like that. So if if you're not in that space, that's something to consider. There's a lot of really great 
um, and very competitive sort of in-person retailers though. And supplements are hard to sell without um, the consultation that, that in-store retailers offer. And so um, I, I, I struggle a little bit on that one. Um, other categories we've seen growing right now are, are plant-based, um, you know, sort of outpacing the average sales growth spaces. Uh, Avi and I talked a lot about cooking at home. Um, and so I wonder if, you know, not necessarily meal kits, but, you know, selling selling some of the staples um, that people can order and reorder on a semi-regular basis, but also because they might be cooking more at home. You know, I, I, I being curious about those categories, but I don't think I'm given a great answer here. And so I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I will. I'll say kind of one one other thing here, which is like, at least personal experience is we're well, I'm seeing and we're seeing like every category being ex explored through uh, online. You know, people are buying cakes online, people and figuring out new and unique ways of packaging. Um, you know, perishable items. So you know, I think you know, Eric and I talked about this the other day when we were prepping. Is you know, a lot of the trends that we're talking about, you know, were happening well before this, right? This has been an accelerant in many ways uh, to existing trends, not so much and 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 the creation of new trends. So certainly there are new trends that are being uh, created and behaviors that are being adopted, but so much of what we're seeing through kind of e-commerce and patterns of behavior um, work from home, sh online shopping. These are all things that have existed. And all that's happened is like the accelerant has has taken it through the roof um, and, and adoption rates are skyrocketing. So, you know, I'd be looking at every category and thinking about how to innovate within some of these kind of new trends and, 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 and deliver value in, in the way that consumers are now displaying their behavior. Okay. Well, we're currently at time, but we have a couple of last questions to ask. So um, Avi a, uh, and Eric, I'll ask a couple more. Um, what sure. role will indulgence items play in the new normal? Sweet goods, pastries, bakery? All of it. <laughs> yeah. I was say the same. Honestly, all most likely all of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, We've seen a lot of interest in functional indulgence foods. Um, you know, we did an analysis a, a year or more back. It's clearly not influenced by by COVID and how people are reacting right now. But if you're in the natural product space, um, you know, indulgence is still huge. There's there's ways of brands doing indulgence with with higher level of purpose or responsibility and sourcing that connect with a more um, thoughtful, aware, conscious consumer. And so I, I do see a lot. We've seen a lot of innovation in that space over the years, and I expect that to continue. Um, consumers are eating healthier. At the same time, there's always room for the paradox in consumers' lives. If I want to eat healthier and I, I need an indulgent treat, uh, consumers manage those things quite well, uh, and I don't see any change to that, if, if that's the question. Yeah, and, and, let's, and let's not forget, we're entering kind of the summer months, and you know, many camps are shut down, a lot of kids are at home, um, parents are juggling and, you know, the idea of having, you know, snacks, both healthy and indulgent are, are certainly going to be top of mind as, as we, you know, hang out at home and, and, and entertain our close circle of friends and family. So I think, as Eric said, I, I agree, like, it's all of it. Okay. Do you see private label making large gains similar to after the Great Recession? Uh, and conversely, do you see premium products gaining share to as people are eating out at restaurants less? Yeah, I haven't done an analysis on the uh, former of those two. On the latter, um, we definitely saw consumers investing more in the hypothesis back in 2008, 2009 time period as we were looking at what happened after the recession was um, was that consumers were. They had more, a little bit more disposable income. They were shifting a lot of spend from out of home to in home, and the margins on out of home is considerably higher. And so it did seem that even during uh, times of financial strain, consumers were were prioritizing um, premium products. And so there wasn't a, a giant decline, you know, in consumers' willingness to spend for health or, or better quality products, in part because, again, that that shift of income from, uh, sorry, that shift of spending from from out of home to in home. I, I have not seen or did not, did not do an analysis um, on the private label space. Again, it wouldn't surprise me. I think the dynamics are a little bit different, you know, 10, 12 years on. And I think consumers don't just want um, a more affordable private label brand. They want something that is modern and, and represents their current needs. But again, to those private label brands that can do both of those reasonably well, I think there's opportunity. 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, just time for a couple more questions. One, I'll jump to one that kind of ties in that. Why do you expect that a large percentage of people will continue to do so much cooking at home when the reality is that as soon as states reopen bars and restaurants, are they're flooded with people? I think I think people will flood to bars and restaurants, but I think also a lot of people have realized that they can do it, right? Uh, and that it may be easier than they thought. And as you start to kind of learn some of these new behaviors, um, you you know, a lot of people are I'm learning are enjoying them. Uh, and so I think some of it is opportunistic in that that people are expanding their you know repertoire and 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 building new skills um, and. I still think even as bars and restaurants are opening, I don't think the experience is going to be the same for a while, right? Um, you're going to have a lot less people uh, in, in each venue. You're going to have potentially servers wearing masks. I think the experience of eating out is going to take a long time to recover. And I think people are realizing that the experience of dining in with close friends and family can uh, can lead to some of the same, you know, emotional benefits. Right. Um, and let's not forget, you know, 20 million people unemployed. It's a lot less expensive to eat in than it is to go out. And I think, you know, we have yet to see the impact, um, you know, of, you know, the stock market seems to you know not care. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the the impact of this unemployment and this recession, you know, will be will be will be shaken for you know a, a few years, certainly within those industries. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that, Avi, is um, I think flooding is easy to see, but I think the reality is there's far fewer people back in restaurants than we might think. Right? We look at beaches, we look at images in the news of people, you know you know, college kids at parties or whatever. Most of most of the data that I've seen suggests that um, close to a majority of people aren't really ready to get back into a lot of these activities. You know, um, you know Avi showed the the flying data and, and a few other pieces earlier, but we have a few data points on going back to restaurants and bars. And I don't remember the exact, but it was probably close to a third, a third, a third, about a third of people say, yeah, I'm probably ready to do this. A third are really kind of on the fence and feeling some stress and uncertainty about it. And a third to maybe more than 40%, 50%, um, you know, are on some of these different metrics are saying, I'm not ready. And so again, it's easy from an optic standpoint to see a bunch of people at a restaurant or a bar without to realize that that restaurant is not doing the turns they used to. That restaurant is not as full. Yeah. They're not, you know, open the same number of hours and that, you know, 20% of the population to 40% of the population is ready, ready to go back, and the vast majority are not. Um, and they're probably going back less frequently. So anyways, I, again, I think the optics here of people being in engaging in these activities is different than the numbers. Totally agree. Okay, um, one last question. Do you have any data about whether consumers are purchasing more local products from local farms and producers, even if that is at a regional larger retailer? I don't, know if we I that. don't have that. Mm -mm. No, I don't have that data. Um, and I haven't seen, you know, point of sale data that would necessarily suggest that. And we didn't get that nuanced with our questions about local, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. It's a good question. Um, well, that you answered that much more quickly than I expected. We can still ask another one. <laughs> <laughs> How are you seeing the future for functional and or natural energy beverages given COVID-19? <laughs> Yeah, the pattern seems to be um, in favor of, you know, I mean, functional energy, pretty specific um, there, you know, energies, energy is always a, a hot, a hot space, you know, lots of competitors in that market. Um, uh, but also a lot of, you know, one of one of the most established spaces, if you will, in terms of, you know, uh, consumers wanting a, an, an end benefit. Um, and we are continuing to see growth and functional. Uh, and so again, a, a well positioned product in this space, I, I expect to, to have opportunity if, if they can stand out relative to the competitors. Um, I don't see a decline there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're just about at time. Um, we had some, we still, we had so many great questions. We weren't able to get to all of them, but as a reminder, Eric and Avi will be answering all of these and responding to everyone's submitted questions. I'd like to thank them again for guiding us through today's conversation. And for those of you who are listening and joining us in today and who stayed with us through the end, this webinar will be on demand within 24 hours and you'll receive an email when it's ready. And our presentation is now concluded. Thank you again.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Avi. Appreciate it. Take care. Stay safe.